Hello all, and welcome to Sweating the Small Stuff, a show where we sweat over the details that make our world richer. I'm your personal brain trainer, Cameron Boozer Jamari, and for this episode, we're actually starting on a new series that I'm calling The Scale of Life. I just want you to picture it. There's so many moments in movie and pop culture where characters are literally larger than life, like, well, I guess not in the fame sense, but think Ant-Man, or in this case, Godzilla. And what I want you to really imagine is you have a creature, a titan, this thing that is so incredibly cool and massive and ancient, or maybe in some variants of it, just a modern irradiated monster that exists on a scale on par with some of mankind's greatest architectural marvels. And while it's super fun to watch him bounce around and crush buildings and do his wonderful thing, it does raise the question, how does the literal scale of life affect Godzilla? What I mean is, Godzilla is huger than the hugest living thing on Earth, and huger still than many dead and extinct things that we are aware of on Earth. Think the Mosasaur, think Megalodons, think blue whales, think brontosauruses. Godzilla, according to the movies, is just leaps and bounds bigger than that. It's not easy for nature to create a titan like that in terms of just trial and error and creating a lasting life form that gets that big evolution is more or less throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what genetic spaghetti sticks. Stranger still is that when an animal is as big as Godzilla, the problems it deals with are completely unlike any challenges any animal that has ever existed would have to face. Godzilla is just an incredibly large creature and his size introduces all sorts of new problems. A creature that big invites equally big questions around what food and resources it needs to stay alive for as long as either version of Godzilla has, either the new remake version in the Godzillaverse or the radiated version that we've seen before. And that's the question we're chasing on today's episode. How does the scale of life affect Godzilla? Now, before we jump in, I should take a moment to mention, if you've been enjoying Swain the Small Stuff, and we we're sure you have, Please think of any of your friends that you think would enjoy hearing about how Godzilla's size affects him biologically, as a movie character, in any sort of way. And if you think you know someone, please do share this episode with them or go find the episode you think they would enjoy because we found the best way to grow our audience is personal recommendation and we're willing to bet they'll thank you for it. So, back to Godzilla. As a primer, allow me to explain why size is very important to life. In many ways, an animal size defines its anatomy because, as I mentioned, every size animal faces different challenges from how it collects energy to how it interacts with its environment and whether those interactions are sustainable. Think of food, for instance. An animal can't magically eat all the food in its environment every day because then it would just run out of resources. The same is true for how the literal physical laws of nature impact different size animals in different ways, not just in terms of their ability to collect and consume resources, but also how they cope with their environment, and how they interact with other organisms. And this spans the orders of magnitudes from microscopic viruses, only a few micrometers across, all the way to whales in the ocean, measuring tens of meters in length. Each of these size categories of animals lives in a world intertwined with those of the other categories. You literally have bacteria inside of you right now, and if my elementary school science professor is to be believed, you are within three feet of a spider at all times, so maybe don't turn around. This begs the question, what happens when we start to play with the size of animals? And I don't just mean that Godzilla, in our case, is a facsimile for just lizards. We're saying, what happens when we create a creature that size? One of the most obvious things we might notice is that as you make animals bigger and bigger, their ability to survive falls from higher and higher heights actually decreases. Let me try to explain with an example. Imagine we drop a spider and a whale off a tall building. Sorry, I know spiders are totally gross and you don't want to think about them anymore, but for this example, they're super useful. As the spider and elephant fall, things like their mass and surface area begin to play a critical role in what happens when they land. Specifically, how much force is going to be felt on impact? On the one hand, the spider is very small, so it has little mass, and by extension, little surface area. Whereas the mighty, mighty whale is quite large, which means it has far more total mass and surface area. However, what matters is how the mass is spread out over the surface area that will determine how much force is felt by either animal on impact. 
Although the whale has a very large surface area, it also has a ton of mass. Whereas the spider is so tiny that even with this very small surface area, its mass in proportion is much less. It has a lower overall density, which means that it will have less energy when it collides with the ground. By extension, the fact that it is so small means that it is now contending with things that the big whale probably wouldn't have to deal with, such as air resistance, which in this place is playing into the spider's advantage because it's helping slow the spider to the point where it would probably collide with the ground from any height and then just walk off. When the whale hits the ground, even though it has so much surface area, it is so dense compared to the spider, it's going to leave a very unfortunate goopy mess all over the sidewalk. And I'm sure you didn't want to think about that today, but you're welcome. Now this density thing, it's true for all life in that as we scale creatures up and up and up from microbes to whales, they're actually passing through these kind of different zones, these different environments where their mass and their overall surface area are going to completely redefine how they interact with the world around them. And one of the clearest ways to understand how this scaling actually is not as linear as you would think, it's not as straightforward, is the fact of what's known as the square cube law. Basically, it's saying that as you increase the size of a creature by one dimension, let's say I took the spider and I doubled its length, its surface area wouldn't actually double, it would quadruple. The amount of skin, the amount of total surface is now four times greater than it was before. And the mass, the goop inside of it, the goop inside of any animal is now eight times greater than it was before. This means that for certain animals, based on how they're able to move, there is a limitation on how big they can get where this goopiness, the amount of mass and surface area that they have, can still make them capable of existing within the environments that they are best suited for. So what does any of this have to do with Godzilla? Well, we scale up to Godzilla's size, and the same math still applies. This dude is literally bigger than most buildings, so he's got an insane amount of mass over an incredible, but unfortunately still limited, surface area. That's why giant monsters in movies always need to move so slowly. If they moved any faster, the sheer force of their footsteps would turn their legs to fleshy goop. In a small way, this is also why many of the titanic animals that we are aware of, such as brontosauruses, We typically found that they were walking on four legs on land or lived in water. In both scenarios, that allows them to distribute their weight so that they don't injure themselves through the sheer act of moving. They're basically putting more weight over the bottom of their foot or they're in the water, which means that their full surface area is being used to displace their movement. Now take a minute and apply any of this logic to the monsters from the Godzilla movies. Those creatures should not be able to run. They should barely be able to walk. And even if they could run, the force of two of them colliding would make for a pretty goopy mess. Pretend for a moment that you're walking around and you have two gigantic buildings as stilts. Every step you take would cause all the windows to shatter and the facade would likely crack. And you're doing this multiple times a minute as you try to trek your way across a very vast landscape. The faster you move, the faster you try to put your legs down one after the other, the more you're going to be damaging those giant buildings. And yes, I understand that biological organisms have all sorts of built-in shock absorbers, but the sheer scale and the effect of gravity on a creature that giant is not something to just be ignored. Now, there's another question that comes into biology at this point when you're playing with scale, and that's the question of energy. Basically, All living organisms need energy to move and hunt and live and do the things that animals like to do. But let's take a minute and really appreciate how energy really works on a biological level. So here's a bio lesson for you. All us nice big living organisms are made up of cells. Doesn't matter if you're a person, a rhino, or Godzilla. You are made up of cells, just a bunch of cells. The bigger you are, the more cells you have. Think of how I kept describing the goopy messes from before. Now in all those cells, there's something called mitochondria. You know, the powerhouse of the cell. I'm sure every single one of you remembers that as the only thing you remembered from bio class. Mitochondria turns food and oxygen into chemical energy so that our cells can do all the things that keep us alive. Weirdly enough, mitochondria in our cells get pretty hot. And there are thousands per cell, meaning your cells are also getting pretty hot. 
Take a moment to appreciate that the average human body temperature is supposed to be around 98 degrees Celsius, and that is when your body's actively trying to cool itself. So you can assume mitochondria are getting at least much hotter than that at any given moment, all up in all your cells. So now we are faced with a problem. Animals, especially big animals, need to get rid of this heat. The bigger an animal gets, the more cells are stuffed inside it, which means the more heat it needs to dump out. While animals have evolved ways to dissipate this heat, like how elephants have large ears that act like big radiators, it's actually just easier for cells of large animals to just not work as hard. In biological terms, this means a slowing of the metabolism, which is basically the rate at which the animal converts food into energy and then expends that energy, which is mutually beneficial to the cell and the animal as a whole. As a bonus, the slower metabolism may actually be a hint at why Godzilla might have such an insanely long lifespan. And I'm here referring to the new movies and not the classic, though I guess the classic might make more sense at this point. Anyway, there is this link between metabolism and the lifespan of an animal. An example of this is tortoises. The oldest known tortoise was about 250 years old, and A big part of this was the fact that tortoises have incredibly slow metabolisms, which means that all the biological processes that happen in their bodies and eventually run out or wear down over time because of cell replication or honestly any number of issues, they're happening so slowly that this just extends the lifespan of the creature. And I could probably talk about this one specific aspect of the relationship between metabolism and longevity for quite a while, but... I think for right now, it might be better to save that for another episode. However, this means there is a sort of upper bound on this. You see, your cells can only slow down so much to the point where they can still do their jobs. Meaning, depending on your anatomy, you can only get so big before your anatomy comes to a complete stop. But this is where I'd like to give Godzilla a pass. For you see, Godzilla has radiation breath. And a little quick background on what radiation breath is. In the most annoying way possible, the definition of radiation in the context of physics refers to the emission of energy as electromagnetic waves or as moving subatomic particles, especially high energy particles, which cause ionization. This is the energy transmitted by radiation as heat, light, electricity, etc. The point is Godzilla's radiation breath is consistently two things, very bright and very hot. And it is this just laser fire, like imagine a dragon breathing fire if you have never seen a Godzilla movie before, just shooting this jet of just bright energy out of its mouth. Even though this is a completely fictitious power, we get a clear sense of just how powerful this energy is because whenever he uses it, it's been consistently bad for whatever creature is on the receiving end, especially Jidorah in one of the more recent movies. Now, for this next part, it is important to understand why the high energy part of the breath is important in terms of identifying what the radiation is made of. You see, there are three kinds of problematic radiation according to world-nuclear.org. There's alpha radiation made of high energy, thick, nasty helium nuclei, basically two protons and a few neutrons stuffed into an atom, flung out from a source. It can be stopped by a sheet of paper, but enough of them together in a breath could be very powerful. Then there's beta radiation made of high energy electrons that can be stopped by a aluminum plate or some equally modestly thick wall. And then there's everyone's favorite catch-all nonsense Hulk juice gamma radiation. This is dangerous because it's just a bunch of high energy photons. This demands thick dense plating material like lead to stop it from irradiating into areas where we don't want it to go. The photons play an important part here because all visible light is photons. So I'd argue that the signature Godzilla light show is actually the product of a dense stream of photons that I'm sure makes for a great attack. But it's also just an emission of Godzilla's super hot insides, this gigantic mass that is just getting so much energy inside it. Now I admit I'm taking a little bit of creative liberty because I just really enjoy Godzilla so much that I would really love to see how this might play out. And for a little clarification, those uh, mitochondria I pointed out before, typically they can get as hot as 50 degrees Celsius or around 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which is way below a nuclear bomb of directed energy, 
But there's also a lot of anatomy we have yet to learn from these movies. So maybe Godzilla's mitochondria just get super hot or have a way to super concentrate energy from his body into his breath. Just as a piece of clarification, a high energy particle just means that the particles are vibrating a bunch by absorbing or being rapidly emitted due to some sort of event in the environment, aka Godzilla's super toasty insides being a pressure cooker that soups up all this energy that is breathed out in like maybe a jet that it might not actually be as radioactive as we like to think of it, or maybe there's some crazy nuclear process going on inside Godzilla that keeps him alive, so instead of doing it the normal way that I guess us multi-celled organisms do it, Godzilla's actually got his maybe own little fusion reactor going on inside him. That said, I'd happily argue that radiation breath, in some form, makes sense as an evolutionary adaptation for super monsters hundreds of feet tall and might be the only way to power such a creature given their incredible energy demands. But unfortunately, I don't really think that gives us enough license to skirt around Godzilla's enormous size and how that would just completely reshape how he should be able to interact with his environment. In the end, how does Godzilla stack up? On the one hand, Godzilla's incredible mass introduces so many questions around energy consumption and just his general ability to move. When he's on land, it, it just feels implausible that something that massive could move as quickly and honestly as agile as he does without injuring himself. But I would like to point out that Godzilla does spend a fair amount of time in the water, so maybe that makes up for it. And what about a super evolved cooling mechanism of radiation breath? This is actually where I had a funny moment because there are a lot of animals in the world that, unlike humans, they don't sweat. They don't have ways to just radiate heat off their bodies. So animals like dogs, they pant so they can help cool their bodies by pushing hot air out and helping get circulation. So if that was really what's going on here, maybe Godzilla is less a lizard and more of a dog. And finally, the, the weirdest thing, in my opinion, is not necessarily that you would have this giant monster, but... We've seen, as, or at least I've tried to explain, that there are animals that live in all these adjacent size categories that span everything from microorganisms to blue whales. So it just feels to me that there would be a lot of organisms between those and a giant several hundred foot tall titan. No matter how ancient, if we really want to enjoy the full natural bliss that is Godzilla and his mega-sized anatomy. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do remember, if you have a friend that you think would enjoy this episode or any of our episodes, share it with them because personal recommendations definitely help us grow our audience. If you want to find more Swing the Small Stuff content or just wherever we're posting whatever random nonsense we come up with, you can find us on all social media at Small Stuff Show. And every so often we put bonus episodes and bonus content on our Patreon, which you can find at bit.ly forward slash STSS Patreon. And we have a subreddit, our small stuff show. You can feel free to go there and comment on posts and make your own posts and whatever you like. Finally, I have been your personal brain trainer, Cameron Boozer Jamari, reminding you from movies to media to the world around us, it's details like these that make it worth sweating the small stuff. Small stuff.